Michelle Sinebra, a fellow in the Center for the Study of War and Society and Assistant Professor in the History Department. And I would like to welcome you to the second in this year's series of lectures uh, known as the Richard McCarthy Lecture Series, uh, brought to Southern Miss in 2006 through the generous sponsorship of Craig Howard and Richard McCarthy, who are here. So thank you once again. <laughs> Um, before we introduce tonight's speaker, I want to remind you about the next series in the, or the le next lecture in the series, which will be a week from today in this room. Um, we're going to welcome uh, Mitchell Yackelson, a historian from the National Archives and Records Administration, who will be giving a talk called Brothers in Arms, Americans Under British Command in World War I. I also want to remind you about our other big um, endeavor within the Center for uh, Getting Involved in the Community, which is the War and Society Roundtable. Lots of you here have participated in that in the past, and the next meeting of the Roundtable is going to be November 12th, led by Dr. Wiest. I see you have a book. Uh, I'm yes. even reading it this time, which is really important for me. Exactly. So it's going to be on Operation Fortitude, or the book is called Operation Fortitude, and this month we also have a film um, about the ghost army. So effectively, the general theme for the discussion on November 12th will be um, kind of, well, I guess, sneakiness in, <laughs> in military <laughs> tactics. Sneakiness in military tactics. So now I would like to introduce tonight's speaker, um, Dr. Alan Allport from Syracuse University. Um, Dr. Allport has a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, and prior to uh, becoming an assistant professor at Syracuse, in the, I've got, sorry, I've got to find it, the Maxwell School, or Maxwell School at Syracuse University. Um, he was a postdoc at Princeton University. Um, he is the author of a book called Demobbed, Coming Home After the Second World War. And his current work, which is what he's going to be presenting to you tonight, um, comes from a book that shares the same title as his talk, Brown Doth, the British Soldier in the Second World War, which is going to be effectively a prequel to the first book, as I understand it. He's told the story already of what happened to the British Army when they came home. Now he's going to go back, George Lucas style, and tell you what happened. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite sure but if I like that. I'm sorry, yes, I realize that as I said it much more successfully yeah. than George Lucas. He will tell the story of um, the men who formed the British Army during the Second World War. And so I will turn the floor over to Dr. Alford. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, uh, first of all, to the, uh, <clears throat> for the History Department and the Centre for War and Society in inviting me down to speak today. Uh, so I had to travel 1,200 miles and 30 degrees of temperature uh, yesterday. It's, um, the weekend there were slight snow flurries coming down in my uh, back garden, and this to, yesterday I was, uh, I was back in July. <laughs> so I'm very pleased to be here. My body clock is not is sort of dealing with the consequences, but uh, but anyway. So I'm going to begin today uh, with a with a flurry of um, statistics, and it's not perhaps the most exciting way to start a talk, but I'm just going to ask you to bear with me for a second because the the significance of this I hope will become clear in a moment. So from 1914 to 1918, and again from 1939 to 1945. Great Britain, for the only time in its history, thus far anyway, mobilized two huge continental-style armed forces. In the First World War, Britain mobilized 6.1 million men. In the Second World War, um, slightly fewer, 5.8 million men, but um, 640,000 women in addition to that. Now, of that 5.8 million men uh, mobilized in World War II, something that represented something like 25% of the entire male population of the United Kingdom at the, at the time. <clears throat> um, something like three out of every five men who were born between 1905 and 1927, and something like seven out of 10 men born between 1915 and 1927. Of the 5.8 million men who served in His Majesty's Armed Forces during World War II, about two-thirds of them, just under 3.8 million, served in the British Army. Of those 3.8 million, over half were conscripted under the various National Service Acts that were introduced, uh, well, the first of which was actually introduced a few months before the war and then were progressively introduced after that. And although the remainder 
of uh, wartime servicemen technically volunteered. They did so with the knowledge that they were likely to be called up eventually anyway. So in some ways, war wartime voluntarism has to be regarded as sort of voluntarism in inverted commas. Now, the point of all these numbers um, is I think that they demonstrate that the mobilization uh, effort in the two world wars was not only the greatest military effort undertaken by the United Kingdom in its history, but also it represented the two greatest sociological experiments that were ever carried out in Britain. And it's that aspect, that second aspect of Britain's wartime experience I really want to talk about this evening. To compulsorily remove a quarter of the entire male population out of civilian life, as happened between 1939 and 1945, and to place it for, in some cases, seven years or more into a social institution quite unlike anything it had previously known, was an audacious piece of social engineering. The army, as wartime recruits quickly discovered, was a nation within the nation, with different laws, different clothes, different standards of conduct. Nothing in civilian life compared to it. You were not hired, you were summoned. You could not quit, though generally speaking, you could not be fired either, no matter how badly you performed. <laughs> you lived, so to speak, at the workplace. There was no clocking on or off. Your employer decided when your duty ended, if indeed it ended at all. You could be relocated without consultation or warning thousands of miles from everything you knew for years at a time. Your fate was decided seemingly at random. A group of soldiers possessing all the agency of, quote, a shuffled pack of cards in a conjurer's hands. Nothing was explained, nothing apologized for. Your superiors could scream at you, insult you, detain you by force, and punish you for crimes which would not even have ranked as minor social solecisms in City Street. Being bareheaded outdoors, for instance, uh, in the army, improperly dressed. Walking across the barrack square with your hands in your pockets. Uh, committing the crime of being idle on parade. Actions that would have been praiseworthy in civilian life, dropping everything to go to the bedside of a sick relative, for instance, were regarded as serious crimes. On the other hand, Actions that would have been both illegal and immoral in peacetime, assaulting perfect strangers, blowing up other people's property, were now regarded not only as part of the job, but as positively meritorious. <laughs> the men who joined the British Army during the Second World War were as diverse as the society that they were defending. They were English, Scottish, Welsh and Irish, British only by descent, and in some cases not British at all. They were Protestants, Catholics, Jews, Hindus, Muslims, freethinkers, and in one interesting case, a Druid. <laughs> Liberals, conservatives, socialists, fascists, and communists. Men who were ideologically driven, men wholly apathetic about politics. Some soldiers supported the war effort with passion and gusto. Others were appalled by violence and unconvinced of its merits. Most were sexually straight, Though some, uh, it's been estimated perhaps as many as a quarter of a million, were not. Many were virginal, a few debauched. <laughs> some were bright, some foolish, some conscientious, some lazy, some compassionate, some mean-spirited, some heroic, some cowardly. In terms of class and education, they ran the entire spectrum from barrister to Borstal runaway, Old Etonian to charity school illiterate. All members, then, of the national community were represented to some degree in the ranks, but not equally represented. If the army was a reflection of society, it was a partial, distorted reflection. Vast numbers of the industrial labour force were excluded from military recruitment entirely by what was called the schedule of reserved occupations because of their indispensability to the war economy. The amount of these uh, so-called reserved workers changed throughout time according to the needs of war production. But broadly speaking, those most likely to be reserved were skilled workers in industries closely associated with military production. That is to say, craftsmen involved in the manufacture of weapons, munitions, aircraft, ships, motor vehicles, and so on. 
Miners, dockers, agricultural workers also received special dispensations. Victorian Britain, in other words, the Britain of steam and iron, of smoky factories and shipyards and pitheads, was on the whole kept out of the army. Those least likely to be reserved were men who had worked in Britain's pre-war construction, retail, processed food, textile, finance and education sectors, all of which contracted drastically between 1939 and 1945. The wartime army was an army of shopkeepers, bricklayers, bank clerks, confectioners, bespoke tailors, accountants, painters, undergraduates, travelling salesmen. Men whose civilian skills were often highly respected and remunerated in time of peace, but poorly suited to the needs of the war effort. <coughs> By the end of August 1944, I have some statistics here, there were 152,000 former van and lorry drivers serving in the ranks of the British Army, 79,000 grocer's assistants, 51,000 decorators and paper hangers, 13,500 chauffeurs and taxi drivers, 12,000 insurance canvassers, 10,500 barbers and wig, wig makers, 6,200 cinema projectionists and ushers. There were men like Richard Terrell, uh, who in September 1939 was a bookish 30-year-old husband and father of two, living in a nice block of flats in Wandsworth in London. The author of two novels, an assiduous book reviewer for newspapers and magazines, it had never crossed his mind that he, of all people, would one day be expected to dress up as a soldier and learn about the parts of a Bren gun or an anti-tank rifle. There were also men like uh, those whom former public schoolmaster Thomas Howarth encountered at his officer cadet school in Bulford in early 1940, typically implausible bunch of temporary warriors. And um, Howarth uh, wrote a a, a short precis of, of each of the men in his uh, group, which are so wonderful that I, I can't but not read them to you. Some of them I don't even really understand, but I just think they're, they're fantastic. So here we go. Williams, 19 years old, insurance clerk. Okay. Mandy, ex-actor and schoolmaster, a face I shall never forget with its humorous but hyper-strained sensitivity. Seymour, Radley and Christchurch, horses and hounds. Taylor, Ersatz gentleman and car salesman. <laughs> Winkles, handsome, worrying, incredibly dull, but his fiancée and accountancy his only interests. Ashby, slick, vigorous, cockney vulgarianism at its most complacent, but altogether memorable. <laughs> Rogers, fascist and Munchausen. <laughs> Watson, pretty, spotty, ineffectual little clerk. Hanks, hobbledy-hoy farmer's lad. <laughs> Knight and Ogden Smith, territorials by branch line from Ealing. So they were reservists. Craycroft, operatic singer with a feather in his hat. <laughs> Blythe, a glorious, contentious Scots engineer, the best product of the hydroelectric age. Everett, chocolate-eating youngster with a pink face and evanescent moustache. <laughs> Kent, Rough and regular, genial, blasphemous anarchist. <laughs> Woodward, African backwoodsman. Ashmore, pocket captain blood, five foot four of military bristle. <laughs> These uh, were not the kind of recruits who the army traditionally relied on in peacetime. The 18 or 19 year old semi-literate boys it acquired from the social margins. Long habituated to institutional discipline, pathetically loyal in many cases to anyone who showed them even the slightest kindness or affection. These were altogether older, worldlier, more self-confident men. Now the RAF and the Navy usually took the pick of the choicest recruits throughout the war, but even so, uh, the wartime army volunteers and conscripts were on the whole far better educated and more socially respectable than the regulars that the army was used to. One in four uh, wartime army recruits was aged 30 or over. One in four had progressed at least as far as secondary school, which in the Britain of 1939 was a, was a disproportionately large amount. One in 20 had been to university. Half of them were married, 
many with young children. As the War Office's publicity director Ian Hay put it, and not with approval, I should know, they were, quote, accustomed to a certain standard of living, had more active and intelligent minds, rebelled instinctively against unimaginative handling by authority, and were irked by monotonous repetition of routine duties, and especially by the emptiness and boredom of hours of leisure. The traditional recreations of the peacetime soldier were not going to be for these men. These were men also who had grown up in the altogether more benign, affluent conditions of 1920s and 1930s Britain, uh, into a country which, for all of its continuing economic and social problems, the number of people living in poverty had more than halved since 1914. Theirs, in other words, was a Britain of smaller families living in better and healthier accommodation, with more food, more money, more education, and more leisure than had been known before the First World War. 25 years of superior diet, sanitation, and exercise had produced a much physically healthier generation of young men. But if they were more physically ready for the demands of war, their mental preparation was in many ways worse than their fathers had been in 1914. Ordinary life for the Edwardian working class had shared many similarities with military service. Austere, physically demanding, subordinated, hierarchical. The soldiers of Haig's army had, many of whom had grown up in a world in which employers liked their workers quote, round-shouldered, servile, and abject, as a foreman in a large Swindon railway workshop. Many of the Tommies of the First World War had therefore become used to the tedium and subservience which would characterize military life long before they ever reached the Western Front. As historian John Bourne has put it, they were inured to a certain degree of physical discomfort and material deprivation. They had quite low levels of expectation. They could put up with a lot. Their sons had tended to live very different lives in the 1920s and 30s, lives of much greater material comfort and personal freedom, in which, as George Orwell put it, a general softening of manners had taken place as the tastes, habits, manners, and outlook of the working and middle classes had begun to converge in Britain. Many light workers in the light, in sorry, many workers in the light industries, Orwell said, are less truly manual laborers than as a doctor or a grocer. Imagine then how baffling and painful it was going to be for this privileged generation to be transported by the army to a Dickensian world it had never known before, a world of workhouse dormitories, Victorian grotesques, and peremptory deference. Military service was going to mean exposure to all sorts of new and often unpleasant, certainly disorienting, tactile, mental experiences, to unfamiliar foods, clothes and belongings, extremes of filth and cleanliness, long stretches of tedium punctuated by bursts of panic, prying eyes, poking fingers, peculiar laws, customs, routines. The moment of arrival for basic training could be terrifying. One soldier watched a conscript intake being received at his regimental depot in early 1940. Many seemed to be under strain, he noted. They had to be asked for details of their families. Some could not remember their children's names. One or two could not even remember their own names. One broke down in tears and had to be consoled on the company commander's shoulder. Writer Geoffrey Cottrell recalled white-faced, round-shouldered young men with spotty skins and no confidence, stumbling through his own camp gates with all the self-assurance of Christians about to be fed to the lions. <laughs> During the first night in barracks, the reality of their new situation began to sink in. Cozy childhood bedrooms with bound volumes of the model railway magazine on the bookshelves, pyjamas and dressing gowns, neatly tagged with names and schoolhouses, had not prepared the new recruits well for iron beds and hard biscuit mattresses, chafing boots, freezing concrete floors, and itchy prison-like smocks. For one soldier, the dormitory was, quote, Chamber of Horrors minus the chamber. <laughs> Odious smells, fetid air, sweaty bodies, tobacco fumes, poor ventilation. The noise was incessant, 
snoring, belching, farting, urinating, the tramp of studded ammunition boots in the hallway. Henry Novi, a 21-year-old clerk, sent to a Royal Army Medical Corps depot in Leeds, settled back on his straw palliasse, his, his straw bedding, tired, depressed, his teeth aching, tried unsuccessfully to sleep. I kept thinking of home, and all that I had left went round and round in my head, ceaselessly, persistently. I felt so depressed that I wanted to cry, but I couldn't. It was, he thought, simply hell. At Dawn Revalley the following morning, the routine of army life began. The new soldier was stripped of his civilian clothing, his civilian haircut, his civilian identity. He was outfitted in battle dress, a standard issue uniform modelled on workmen's overalls that made you look, as one soldier put it, like a sack of potatoes tied in the middle. With the new soldier's uniform came other labels, categories, grades. All the information that mattered about the recruit was now reduced to a series of penciled scribbles on his AB64 service and paybook and charge sheet. His name, his rank, his seven-figure identification number, his official religion, you had to have a religion if you were in the uh, British Army, boot size, and list of previous military crimes. <laughs> <laughs> Batteries of doctors appraised his naked flesh to determine where to slot him on the scale of usefulness. Military psychologists calculated his level of intelligence, his propensity for certain types of trade, his emotional stability, his willingness to kill. He had become an anonymous tooth on a great whirring cog. His mornings and afternoons were now spent tramping the square, learning parade ground commands, up and down, round and round, working the arcane minutiae of drill into his muscle memory. Evenings were the time for meticulous spit and polish, or what was known amongst uh, the soldiers themselves as bullshit. <laughs> the fragrances of heated boot black and the sweet, gluish odours of liquid cleaner wafted along barrack corridors. Soldiers were caught up in what was described as a feverish activity of housewifery. <laughs> Floors were polished until they had the surface of a glassy rink and were far too dangerous to actually walk on. <laughs> Stoves meticulously black leaded. Fire buckets glossed a dazzling pillar box red. Soldiers dyed webbing with watery colouring compounds called Blanco. Polished hollow brass buttons to a glistening sheen. Pressed the creases of khaki trousers to a knife-like edge. And smoothed lovingly the surfaces of boots with warm spoons. Soldiers preened and fussed over one another before inspection. Tugging at one another's blouses and belts and berets. Trying to fine-tune their shapeless ensembles to the correct angle of adjustment. Titivating themselves like actresses, as one man described it. <laughs> Not that all this spit and polish was necessarily, correlate, necessarily correlated with healthiness. While the army was obsessive about the physical appearance of its men on parade, it often seemed curiously uninterested in what they looked like underneath their uniforms, never mind what they smelled like. Three weeks might pass before a man might be able to take a bath. Epidemics of lice and scabies broke out. What I have to put up with, a Royal Army Service called Private wrote home from camp in the Orkney Islands. Bad grub, wet clothes and blankets, no beds to sleep in, a wet tent that leaks like a sieve, no lavatory. I tell you, they have broken my spirit, so when I go to bed at night I can sob my heart out. I've started getting rheumatism already. The first chance I get, I shall desert, never fear. <laughs> And dessert, many of them did. <clears throat> By 1942, an epic of absenteeism had broken out in home forces. In almost every unit, notes the official history of wartime army morale, there was, quote, a constant and by no means negligible proportion of men disappearing from camps and bases. Over 1,300 soldiers a month were being discharged for psychoneurotic reasons. As the medical journal The Lancet noted, the army was having to deal with far more men who had collapsed under the strain of military discipline and separation from their families than from the trauma of battle. The War Office's own quarterly morale reports made for sober reading. The typical soldier, they uh, suggested, felt that he was unappreciated, underemployed, 
becoming mentally conditioned to see himself as an inferior being. The army today is grumbling and mumbling, murmuring and muttering, simmering with tales of discontent, thought the journalist Franco. I can scarcely find a man who does not profess his burning desire to be in mufti, so be back in civilian clothes. The man who admits he is glad to be a soldier is regarded as a crank. <laughs> Tommy Atkins, in other words, was thoroughly browned off. So I come to the title of my paper here, Browned Off. Now, according to the invaluable guide to service slang that was compiled by two men called J.L. Hunt and R.A. Pringle, it was published in 1943, Browned Off was, quote, the single most important expression in the British Army. To be browned off was to resemble a piece of meat that had been too long cooking. It represented, uh, they defined it as, a kind of indifference, a state in which personal feelings and interests appear to have been suspended while the disciplined cog goes through the normal motions. To be browned off was not to rebel as such, but it was to accept a sense of hopeless resignation in the face of unreasonable and unchallengeable authority. It was a condition which was endemic throughout the British Army by 1942. Now there are a couple of ways to talk about how the wartime army, army worked through its own browned offness, if you like. Um, one is a top-down story of reforms and innovations directed by the War Office from the midpoint of the war onwards which was fortunate to have a particularly sympathetic and intelligent adjutant general <coughs> by the name of Sir Ronald Adam. And you know, if, we, if we get to that point in questions and answers, I'd be happy to kind of exp expand upon that. But that's not the story that I want to uh, tell today. I want to talk about the ways in which soldiers themselves tried to achieve some kind of accommodation with the army, to stress that they had agency as actors in this story, rather than merely being the acted upon. Each soldier had to decide on what terms he was willing to make peace with his new life. For some men, such a deal proved to be impossible and they fled. But most were not as uncompromising as this. In the end, they were able to achieve a kind of grudging acquiescence with the army, quietly despising some aspects of its culture, rarely absorbing its worldview entirely, but all the same, finding some middle ground which made their day-to-day -day existence tolerable. Now, in this, uh, in this area, the, the regular soldiers who they uh, served alongside with were invaluable because many learned from the regulars the art of outwardly conforming and inwardly rebelling, the low comedian's performance of superficial obedience, all bogus boot stamping and spuriously smart salutes, supplemented by secret dodges and ways of avoiding any unnecessary exertion. The trick was to learn your part, to memorize your lines, appear to take the rules seriously, and implement them scrupulously, while all the time quietly gaming the system to your own advantage. One of the golden rules for raw recruits which Arthur Calder Marshall suggested in the 1941 article was, quote, do everything which you can't avoid briskly, smartly, and efficiently, remembering that the majority of fatigues, uh, fatigue duties, are given to those who look as if they don't want to do them. And pretend to punctiliousness of procedure, even to the point of idiocy. The man who appears over careful not to transgress any of the army rules can get away with twice as much as the man who doesn't give a damn. <laughs> Wise soldiers never argued, but at the same time, they never did any more work than they absolutely had to. Malingering with style, giving off the appearance of earnest busyness without actually doing anything, was considered by some to be an art form, perhaps in academia too. <laughs> And then there were your mates. Privacy in the army was non-existent. Men slept together, dressed and bathed together, paraded together, ate together, panted and sweated around obstacle courses together, showered together, bared their genitals for medical inspection together. 
This was both claustrophobic and liberating. Your comrades' lives became your own. For some men who had grown up in particularly inhibited households, this was shocking, but also thrilling. The novelist, uh, science fiction novelist Brian Aldiss uh, discovered that all the social taboos that he had acquired through childhood, all the codes, as he put it, designed to hide what one was really hoping, feeling, enjoying, suffering, had suddenly vanished now that he was in the army. You could be your own awful self, he said. All the hypocrisies of home life dissolved. The dormitory, agreed another soldier, was a haven of camaraderie in the midst of the army's horrors. With its warm and smoky fog, profusion of blankets, and everlasting Dixie of lukewarm tea. After the day's last parade was over, uh, you and your mates lounged on their beds, polishing your boots, writing letters, joking and arguing about everything. The barrack room, he said, was perhaps the most complete democracy in the world. Your mates formed the innermost of what Arthur Culver Marshall called the structure of greater alliances you needed to survive as a soldier. The series of concentric loyalties from which you drew strength. Platoon against platoon, regiment against regiment, the rankers against what were, of course, the ultimate enemy, them, usually represented by the NCOs and the officers. But the thing about soldiering was that, however much you might hate it at first, you could turn out to be good at it. Better, perhaps, than at anything you'd ever done before. The army could bring out qualities in you that you never knew existed and found that you liked. One man, J.B. Tomlinson, had entered the Royal Engineers as a trainee architect, a profession he had never found easy because of his lack of innate skill in drawing and freehand expression. <laughs> Being a soldier, however, he took to like a duck to water. I was a natural, he said, a peg which had found its right hole at last. Suddenly, his pre-war middle-class life in a provincial town seemed synthetic, shallow, insignificant, unimportant, when set against the exciting new world which the army, army was opening up for. The army burnished self-confidence. It offered boyish excitements. It gave you playgrounds and sports. It allowed you to ride motorcycles, drive trucks, You've got to handle weapons and destroy things. <laughs> <laughs> One recruit, Harry Wilson, recalled with glee the first time he was issued a rifle. For a long time, he said, I couldn't let it alone. It was a thrill to handle it and a reassuring pleasure to see it recline powerfully and gracefully against the garret wall. I should add that he actually had no bullets at this stage, but he didn't have a rifle. Another soldier, John Guest, discovered how much he enjoyed sentry duty on warm, starlit nights, watching the sunrise, listening to the birds chorus uh, in splendid isolation. Even spit and polish bullshit could have its satisfactions. There could be a simple zen-like enjoyment in polishing boots immaculately for hours at a time, gently circling the leather with the bone handle of a toothbrush lubricated with polish, water and spit. Not very relevant to the war effort, perhaps, but a pleasurable enough in its own way. And for a few, there was also the discovery of the pleasure of obedience, something that they had never experienced in civilian life before, complete submission to a superior's will. Norman Craig and his mates, who had begun by despising all manifestations of army authority, began, in the end, deliberately seeking out officers, just so they could demonstrate the beauty of their own salutes. We would stride brazenly past, he recalled, feigning to ignore them, until the final second, when, with a stiffening of the frame and a sharp eyes right, we would flash out a copybook salute of quivering rectitude. They began to feel contempt for anyone whose existence was softer, less disciplined, for anyone who did not wear khaki, who could not drill, whose trousers still went uncreased. All of the screaming and bullying and bullshit had done its job for these men after all. There was, Norman Craig thought, an element of ecstasy 
a strangely joyous satisfaction in such subservience. The war had revealed something which, depending on your point of view, was either reassuring or disturbing. But even in the meekest, mildest, most modern-minded British boy, there lay something of the efficient, dedicated, war-winning, fanatical Nazi stormtrooper for the army to bring out. Thank you very much. Soldier was going to be counterproductive. 
And so he introduced a number of, of uh, innovations, some of which were more successful than others. One of the things that he did was that he realized that the army was doing as, as bad a job of personnel selection in, uh, in 1941 as it had done during the First World War. Because this is partly a product of the, uh, the British Army's Union regimental system. Because it's subdivided into individual um, infantry and, and cavalry regiments, the, the bulk of it anyway. Uh, what tended to happen is, is that you, you tended to end up in the, either in the regiment that you, you, you uh, uh, the regiment that in, in which uh, was, had the catchment area that you were recruited into. And so often ended up doing a job that you were not particularly well suited for. And there were already there were horror stories by 1941 about you know trained engineers serving as cooks in officers' messes and things like this. So one of the things that Adam did was to create uh, first of all what was called the Directorate of, of uh, Personnel, which introduced uh, psych psychology into uh, personnel selection for the first time. Actually, trying to uh, give recruits a battery of psychological tests to kind of try to figure out more about what they were like you know, what their character and personality and what their skill set was, so that you could put them into the right place. When he received, there was a tremendous amount of resistance to this uh, within the army itself, because it was seen as being an attack on the regimental system, which was regarded, wrongly I think, as being sort of a, a, a essential to the core of army morale. So, so Adam did this, uh, he also generally tried to humanize the experience of being a soldier, Increasingly, by the end of the war, he tried to introduce more and more elements of, of, of uh, he tried to, I guess you could put it, civilianize the soldier's experience. He recognized, for instance, that um, wartime recruits were not going to cut themselves off from civilian society in the way that peacetime regulars tended to do. Peacetime regulars tended to be men from the socioeconomic margins. I mean, these were, these were men who usually were desperate enough to join the army, who joined because they were leaving nothing behind. And as a result, the, their connections with civilian life were already pretty attenuated to begin with, and they became weaker still. Um, in other words, you really didn't have to worry too much about the soldiers' relationship with the back home. With wartime soldiers, of course, it was completely different. They uh, mentally never considered themselves to be first and foremost soldiers. They considered themselves to be civilians who were temporarily serving uh, in the forces, but they never, uh, you know, they never felt that they wanted to break away from civilian life. So you have to do things like uh, exercise uh, a more flexible leave schedule. You had to add an introduced ways of uh, providing welfare officers who could go out to individual families, find out if they were suffering from financial hardships, try to see if the army in some way could assist them, in order to obviously to relieve the concerns that soldiers might be having, you know, about what their families were doing. Marital infidelity and, 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 and problems of, of marriage were a problem that the army felt that it had to get involved with during the war because of the fears of soldiers, particularly those serving overseas, that their, their wives were being unfaithful, that, they were, that their marriages were breaking down. And so welfare officers, again, had to go out and see if they could arrange if... if you know, if a, uh, if a husband and wife were, had uh, you know, reached a point at which they were no longer speaking to see if they could arrange some kind of concili reconciliation and so on and so forth. So that's the kind of the other stuff. That's the sort of the top-down story of how the, the army worked through its brown darkness. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more today, though, about something which I think is not discussed so much, which is how soldiers themselves actually tried to adjust to the situation they were in. Do you think the average Brit had a better standard of living than an American at the same time who was more of an agrarian, still in an agrarian society? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I think, I, I, comparatively, I'm not, I'm not quite sure where, where things stood in 1939. I mean, I suspect that the, the average, you'd say, East Coast urban dweller in the United States probably had a better standard of living than, than his, peer, his or her peer in, in Britain. But of course, you know, the majority of, well, I guess the majority of people in 1939 in, in the States, this is, this is still, if not overwhelmingly an agricultural country, then still very, you know, uh, very agricultural, and also going through the effects of the Great Depression. I mean, I, I think the, I mean, to, I, I'd like to know more actually about the, the sort of transatlantic comparison. But what I, what I think is true, definitely true, is that on the whole, people in 1939 in Britain 
were living longer, healthier, more prosperous lives than they had lived in 1914. And that was the thing that the army was, in a sense, having to deal with, the fact that you had different kinds of young men coming into this institution. What, what's the role of sports at this time? Are the football clubs and cricket going full steam or uh, on the bases? Or uh, yeah, I mean, they, they certainly, they, 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 you know, their football games were played, uh, cricket was, uh, was very big, I mean, this, you know, inter-service, uh, inter inter-regimental uh, boxing was a, is, a, is a big thing, particularly amongst different regiments. I mean, these were all uh, traditional uh, ways in which, you know, the army tried to build senses of regimental esprit de corps and, and, and so forth. One of the complaints, though, funnily enough, about, about this was in the 30s, was that uh, the young men of Britain were becoming soft and not pursuing the manly sports of boxing and so forth. And all they wanted to do from, at this point was to sort of, you know, play whist and, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, go to the cinema and things like this. So the army actually adopted a kind of toughening up process in, in, uh, in, 19, in, in response to the defeat at Dunkirk in 1940, there was a sense in which um, you know, one of the reasons for that failure had been that the army hadn't been tough enough. And so there was, for many commanding officers, I think there was a sense that we need to try and make these guys, you know, we, need, we need to knock this, the, the, the softness out of them that's being inculcated in civilian life. Um, I think that to some extent that may have worked, but I think, as, as I suggested with talking about Adam, I think that the problem was is that these just were not the same kind of men, you know, and that the civilian taste had changed, uh, and there was a limit to how, you know, there was a limit to how tough you were going to be able to make them by dialing up the amount of drill and, and so forth. Before America entered the war, did a lot of Americans enter the RAF and the, um, the British Army? Did a lot of Americans enter? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I think that you, you get um, a, a sort of trickle of people coming through Canada and so forth, don't you? Because, uh, and I guess, you know, you've, you've had a few people who were able to, I guess it was, it was cheaper probably to go to Canada and, and join up and to get shipped across the Atlantic than to actually do it yourself. Uh, but, you know, there were small, small amounts of foreigners, always. For the re the officers of the regiments, I, I really have no background of this at all. So I'm curious. So they are recruited from a different office than the same locations that the regiments are recruiting from. So they're not actually being pulled from the same pools, or are they? Well, officer officer recruitment is the pre-war situation. So the situation in the regular army before World War Two was that you had it was a curious thing. You had essentially a feudal army. You had an army that drew its personnel from two totally different pools. The, the underclass, the, predominantly the urban underclass, went into the rank the ranks. Um, the officer corps was drawn largely from a segment of the upper middle and upper classes, the county squirearchy, as it was sometimes known. Um, so these tended to be uh, not necessarily sort of blue-blooded toughs, but people uh, who have pretensions towards gentility. One of the things about the army was that it gave you the opportunity to play at being a gentleman without necessarily needing a lot of money to be able to do it. So if you wanted to be able to spend much of your time riding, uh, playing, uh, you know, involved in blood sports, play, you know, in, in field sports and so forth, particularly if you went to India, you could do this very, very cheaply because of the, the, the differential between your pay and, your, and the cost of living. So that, that was the situation before World War II. Now, when World War II breaks out, that social segment that the army has traditionally drawn on is far too narrow to be able to provide the number of officers for a, a huge continental-sized army. And also, I think it's also regarded as being politically unacceptable, too, by 1939. Britain is a, is a meritocratically enough, you know, a meritocratically aware enough state that that's not going to be tolerated. So what you have is, you have a widening of the, uh, the officer corps. The army introduces a rule which basically says that you have to serve in the ranks before you can become an officer. And uh, membership in the officer corps will be theoretically open to any soldier who can show the necessary talent, ambition, and so forth. Now, that's the theory. In practice, 
I think I remember seeing that, you know, you would, if you would have been to a public school, which of course, remember in Britain means an elite private school, you were something like 14 times more likely to become an officer than you were if you were to a regular state school. So clearly, uh, there was a strong uh, set of biases that were built into the system still that tended to inc encourage, quote unquote, the, the, the right kind of people to become officers. But you did get some unlikely figures coming up. And, um, in Demobbed, actually, in, in my first book, I talked a little bit about some of these rather old stories where you would have people like street cleaners before the war who had ended up as captains and majors, and then they were demobilized and had to figure out a place for themselves in society where they had gone from being at the, you know, very much in part of the, uh, the lower working class to, to being gentlemen, temporary gentlemen. I was wondering um, if the experience of World War II had any lasting effects on the military culture of the British Army, um, as well as did any of the reforms, the, the civilization of the Army, did any of those stick? That's, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, uh, Jeremy Crang, who's at the University of Edinburgh, uh, wrote a book about this, which uh, dealt with a lot of this kind of this top-down stuff. And he asked that question. And I think the answer is sort of. Um, which is, I guess, like, you know, classic kind of historian's answer. That's, you know, uh, it's, it, I think uh, a lot of, the, uh, in the short term at least, a lot of the kind of reforms that Adam tried to introduce went by the wayside because the army in 1945 wanted, I think, to try and revert to the model that it had always had in peacetime, which was to be a very, very small professional force that was recruited, as I say, primarily from two very different kinds of socio-economic groups. A very feudal, pre-industrial kind of army. That wasn't really possible, though, I mean, partly because even after World War II, conscription continues for another 15 years. They still have national service. So you've still got elements of that wartime system coming at less, lasting all the way until 1960. The bigger difference, though, I think, ultimately, is just that Britain was changing. You know, but the, the modern British army, in many ways, you know, has gone back to a very, very traditional recruiting model. It, you know, uh, it recruits from the kind of, you know, the, the, the Medway towns of, of uh, you know, um, of the, of the of southeastern uh, England. It recruits from um, the kind of what you would call Rust Belt um, towns. Of the kind that I grew up in near Liverpool, you know, these are these are these tend to be kids who left school at 16, uh, who had very, you know, who have been let down in many ways by the by the you know the education and social system. You still get an enormous number of officers who come from the upper middle classes and above. They're called Ruperts uh, by the by the, the soldiers themselves because you know because it seems like they're all called Rupert. You know? <laughs> in, that, in that sense, you know. Uh, Although maybe he's slightly an extreme, but you know Prince Harry, who's made a, decided to make a career of as, as as a soldier, is not really that unrepresentative an officer. I mean, he's as I say, he's slightly an unusual case, but he's not he's, he's not a wildly unusual case. I mean, you know, he's he's a public school boy. A lot of a lot of officers today are. Having said that, though, you know, you've still got a, a country in which even people from the social margins have come to get have gotten used to a much higher standard of living than, than existed in 1940. And so um, the army's had to adjust to that, you know, as far as I know. I mean, it's not, you know, the, the modern army is not really my area, but, you know, my, my, my sense is, is that, you know, like it or not, the British army has to reflect the fact that, you know, if we're now in a, an age of reality TV and email and all the rest of it. Is the army a viable option for lower um, class... Uh well, it is, although it's uh, not, not quite so much now because recruiting is in a bit of a hole. Although, actually, the, uh, the one area in which I still believe that there is a healthy demand is it for uh, the, regi the infantry regiments. Because this has been true, I think, of... Uh, so, actually, it's always been true of the U.S. Army, as far as I understand, as well. It's the one thing that they are always short of is combat infantrymen. Uh, in part because being a combat, combat infantryman tends to be the least prestigious, worst paying, most dangerous job that you can have in the services. And so there's always a healthy demand for those. And that tends to be the place, I mean, you know, people, of my, you know, my own peers, people I went to school with, entered the, entered the army, you know, rather than going on to university or whatever. And 
it made perfect sense. They were, they were classic archetypes in that way, of, the, of the, the kind of soldiers that the armies always relied on, the peace time. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the, on the numbers that you were uh, tossing out at the beginning, I found a lot of them to be fascinating, and one of them that gripped me the most was the idea that 1,300 men a month were released for psychiatric uh, reasons, evidently before they even reached combat. Mm -hmm. It was um, kind of astounding. Uh, of course, the military often has a fine line between, you know, uh, psychiatric, true psychiatric problems and malingering just to get out of the, uh, or, or perhaps using that as a way to get out of the army rather like Corporal <coughs> Nash or something like that. Mm -hmm. and how did the army deal with this? Was there, were there psychiatrists on call or the, was it rough justice? How was well, in 1939, there was virtually no psychiatric care of any kind. In the army. I mean, they had been, there had been some, you may know, you know, you, you have an interest in this area. I mean, there had been some experimentation with this in, in World War One. During, between the wars, this was all largely done away with. And so the army in 1939, in some ways, ends up right back where it started. With, with, you know, hardly anybody in the Royal Army Medical Corps had any kind of psychiatric back training or anything like that. Um, you do get, I think what happens is with Adam in particular, Adam, Adam is a, is a, is a major figure in trying to push this. What, what the army, I think, realizes is not so much that it needs to, um, what it really needs to do is to figure out, there are lots of people that are entering the army who never should have been allowed to join in the first place. And the filter system in there was very poor in 1939. So you get a lot of men who are recruited, who don't have anything physically wrong with them, but it, fairly, it becomes clear fairly early that they are going to be useless as soldiers because they have various, you know, psychoneurotic problems, which, uh, you know, are, are basically untreatable, at least in, a, in, in the immediate term. So one of the things that the Director of Service Personnel does is that it, it starts to try and use psycho psychiatry in, an, in, a, in, a, in a more imaginative way for the first time, to try and figure out basically who's nuts, you know, or who is... <laughs> or, or also, the, you know, there are, I mean, there are sorts of problems of intelligence. I mean, there are, sim there are simply men who are ju just of subnormal intelligence who clearly are not going to be able to function, you know, effectively as soldiers. I mean, they do create the Pioneer Corps, which is, which is designed, this is one of the reasons why it's so low on the totem pole, is because it's essentially the, as, it's actually a rather strange mixture, the Pioneer Corps, the Labour Corps. So it's, it's a mixture of those men who aren't considered intelligent enough to, um, to perform normal service duties, plus a whole bunch of enemy aliens who are, not, who are uh, usually uh, highly overeducated, but are considered, at least at the beginning of the war, to be too untrustworthy <laughs> to give it any other duties. So you tend to have you know, men with an IQ of 80 or so serving alongside you know, history professors from <laughs> German universities. <laughs> <and so forth. laughs> it, 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 it's an in interesting sociological experiment in its own right. You know. <laughs> Um, but the, the armies, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the problem, when, 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 as the army becomes more involved in combat as the war goes on, and, you know, the, the Second World War is, is different from the First World War for the army because um, whereas in World War I, you know, sort of right from the get-go, it's involved in the action on the Western Front and it continues to be so all the way through the war. In, in World War II, it's been more of a slow ramping up. So really quite late in the war, as late as D-Day, most soldiers in the British Army have never been in combat, have never experienced combat. And I'm not just talking about the service guys in the tail, I'm talking about the guys in the teeth, um, so the infantry, have never actually fought. So you get an enormous spike in 1944 and 1945 of cases of you know, what they were then calling battle exhaustion. And they had to start thinking, you know, based upon some of the experiences that they had in the desert and in Italy, they had to start thinking seriously about this. And it, there is, a, on the whole, a much more... I guess, sophisticated understanding of this by, by the end of the war. But, you know, the other big problem is, as I say, not, not one of you know, a battle trauma, but simply one of either fundamental in, in, incompatibility with the army or, you know, discovering that men just can't, can't adjust, you know. And, and again, Adam, I think, sort of realising that there comes a point where you just can't keep you know, forcing these guys to try and be soldiers. They're just, it, it simply is a, it is a pointless effort. You know, it's wasting far more energy than simply allowing them to be, go off and do something else. One last question, anyone?
I'll take it because sure. I do have a follow up from um, Alan and Dr. I'm sorry, my brain's going dead. Uh, first question. So, what I'm, I'm, I'm curious though, like, what type of uh, sociology went into picking out where they were putting the regiments for recruitment though? So, you said uh, oftentimes people would kind of sign up for with, at a certain regiment and whatever that, whatever that regiment was doing is what they want to do. It was not really related to their job. But how did they, how did the military map where they were sticking these recruitment offices? And was there any sort of like social racism involved um, basing it off like immigration populations in towns or something? Hmm, that's interesting. I mean, the, the British Army proper uh, is almost exclusively white during the war. I mean, that's obviously... The, the, the British Empire composes a number of different military organizations, many of which have enormous numbers of non-white soldiers, the Indian Army, the various African uh, colonial armies, and so forth. The British Army itself uh, is almost entirely recruited from the United Kingdom, and in 1940, Britain is almost in entirely a, a, you know, a white country. Um, Irish and Welsh and Scots. Well, you know, but you do get, you, you get sort of, uh, I'm, not sure if I, I'm not sure if I would use race, Exactly is the category for that, but you do get um, maybe you do you do also get a strong element of classism involved, which sometimes is, is a sort of is a, is a you know has performs in similar ways to racial uh, ideas, racial taxonomies. Mm -hmm. So you do get certain ideas about working class men are inherently suited to doing this kind of thing and so forth. Um, the thing about the army is is that in 1939 it's very small and it's almost all teeth. In other words, it's almost all infantry soldiers, a few cavalry, some artillery, and so forth. But the service element, the support, the logistical side of things, it's very, very small. One of the things that happens during the war is not only in absolute terms does the army get much bigger, but the proportion of the tail, the supply and logistical side of the army, gets much, much bigger. And this is one of the consequences. It's an end, it, it, endless frustration to Churchill, who's always complaining about why don't we have enough guys with bayonets, basically. And, um, Sir uh, um, um, Alan Brooke, who's the chief of the Imperial General Staff, is always trying to say, well, you know, if you want to have an army with tanks, you know, you have to have not just guys who command the tanks, but also mechanics to fix the tanks and drivers to bring the gas to the tanks and all the rest of it. In other words, the more modern this army is, the bigger that tail is just going to get all, you know, all the time. And with the, with, this, with the increase of the tail, you get an increasing uh, multiplicity of trades. So the, the amount of trades and skills required in the army massively expands. And so this is one of the reasons why selection, the selection process has to get much more sophisticated. Because you know, if you've got an army in which you almost, almost certainly your job is going to be to be an infantryman, it doesn't really matter that much what your background is. I mean, you, you know, you'll, you, the, the, the kind of skill set you need for that isn't necessarily going to be defined by that, but if you've got an army where you've got mechanics, where you've got engineers, uh, where you've got an increasingly number of people involved with the medical services and so forth, you do actually need to get some sense about whether they can do these jobs. And, the, and, and for the first couple of years, the army does an absolutely terrible job of this. And again, it's because of the way that the recruitment system has traditionally been extremely decentralized. Uh, because the regiments are very jealous of their own prerogatives and they want to be able to recruit their own men as much as possible. Adam tries to centralise the process. He actually creates something called the General Service Corps by 1942. So what that is, when you initially join the army, you don't join a particular regiment. You join uh, this thing called the General Service Corps. And they will, they will do your basic training for you and they will figure out where you, sh where you ought to go in the pecking order. General Service Corps doesn't survive 1945 because, again, it's the pushback from the regiments. They don't like this at all. Um, but um, that's one of the ways in which they have to try and figure out a much, more, a much better way of, of getting the right people to do the right jobs. Well, uh, can you please join me in thanking Dr. Alton? Thank you.
Uh, just a reminder again. To